So tonight we're going to talk about container gardening uh, with the idea that many people may, not, may have a limited space in which to grow something, whether it's uh, a patio or it's an apartment. Um, and so they may have limited space for vegetables and flowers, but that doesn't mean you can't create something that's, that's beautiful and useful. So tonight we'll talk about the basics of growing flowers and edible plants in a limited space. And the, the first thing we're gonna run through is some of the common elements of container gardening, whether it's for flowers or for food. First thing being talking about containers themselves, we'll talk about the differences in soil versus ground soil, we'll talk about what you need to do differently for watering and for fertilizing, and also how you can take advantage of the sunlight when you're using containers. So the first step, we're gonna talk about the containers themselves, all the different kinds that are out there. And the first one is glazed ceramic containers. And these typically will run about 30 to $100, depending on the size of them. The big advantage of glazed containers is that the, there's a huge variety out there. There's all kinds of different colors, there's different textures, there's different shapes, there's different patterns. So really you can find just about anything you want um, in a glazed container. The downside of these is they're pretty heavy, particularly as you get to larger ones. So if you're looking to move containers around or you've got to take it up a couple flights of stairs in an apartment, um, they can be difficult to move around and maybe you, you consider something lighter weight like a plastic container. Similarly are terracotta containers. So these are also clay based and the difference between these and the glazed ones is that they are not glazed. They are, they are fired pottery that ends up being porous. So air can go through there, moisture can go through there. So they actually breathe a little bit. Uh, their price ranges run similar to the, to the glazed ones, starting at $30 for the smaller ones up to well over $100 or $150 for bigger ones. But a lot of people like them because of the classic appearance. Um, I've got a bunch of them in my yard. And that breathability that they have is, is really kind of advantage, an advantage to uh, a, a plant that doesn't need a whole lot of moisture all the time. So for instance, citrus does well when it's allowed to dry out a little bit between waterings. And so they tend to work well in, uh, in terracotta pots. But the porosity can also be a disadvantage because you end up having to water more and you need to water more thoroughly. You need to water right out to the edges of the pots where that moisture will actually wick into the, into the pottery. They're also heavy, uh, just like the glazed ones. And they can also be more fragile. Um, I've had my dogs knock over a bunch of them and where a glazed pot wouldn't break, uh, the terracotta pots will. And then we have lightweight plaster containers or a lot of resin. There's many different new containers on the market. The resin, lightweight. Um, if you have a bad back you, or just can't lift something real heavy, the plaster and the resin containers are great. They usually have holes drilled in the bottom, but you could always drill it in yourself. Uh, they are a little pricey. Uh, they can go range anywhere from... $40 up to $200, depending on the size. Um, but they're great to, to move around in the garden easily. The downside is there's not many uh, colors, different colors on the market. You've got the gray, light gray, dark gray, brown, and tan. I haven't seen much, uh, many different colors out there other than these colors here and the few others, like I mentioned, the brown. But they're lightweight and uh, they do retain water. Mm, they do dry out faster than 
um, your glaze container, for sure they would dry out faster, but they do work. Plastic. Plastic will dry out definitely faster and it'll heat up in full sun. That plastic will heat up. Uh, but there's many colors on the market now. You've got that teal, gray, bright yellow. There's reds where it used to just be the, the so-called terracotta and the dark brown. So a lot of different shapes, sizes. The prices are pretty good. Uh, most, most inexpensive would be the plastic pots, of course. But they come usually with pre-drilled holes. If they don't have it, it's easy to put it in. All containers need drainage. Um, you might be able to get away. I don't know how, but I guess you're just very careful on the watering. But for a successful container, make sure it has at least one hole at the bottom. But the plastic are nice. I do like them. Uh, depends if that's your style, if it fits with your with um, your style of garden, the plastic ones are great, but they do dry out faster, so you'll need to water more frequently. The galvanized steel containers are very popular. These are um, made to be horse troughs. Uh, this one's, uh, I have herb planted in that, and that's about two feet wide and six feet long and it's about a foot tall. I have maybe three or four in my garden. They're not in full sun because that, that galvanized steel does heat up uh, quite a bit. So they get good morning sun, but most of these containers that I have are in afternoon shade. They don't come with, with holes on the bottom. So I've in that size, I think I drilled about 20 different holes in there. It does have a drainage hole on the, on the side, but that doesn't really work well when you have plants planted in them. So make sure you drill holes in these. Um, if you're using a taller container, you don't have to fill it all the way up the soil. You can use uh, packing peanuts that don't decompose, fill it up halfway, and then uh, put weed fabric on top of that, and then your potting soil on top of that. Uh, these do get hot. They're pretty expensive. Um, probably best buy would be at a feed store instead of a nursery. Uh, the larger ones can go up to 200, maybe 250 for a large one, but they'll last you forever. Um, they make nice planters. You could plant a lot in that size. Um, you could put tomatoes. You could do you know, everything, flowers, sap, tall plants. You could do a lot in a galvanized container. Just make sure um, you might have to water it a little more often. And I also, that is not sitting directly on the ground. I like to use risers right there. I have that on bricks. So it's not directly on the ground. That helps it drain better, but it also keeps it from heating up as fast. When I have that that hot cement and then the container sitting directly on that hot cement, it just gets even hotter. So you do want space between your containers. So the next one's wine barrels. Um, these have gotten pretty popular over the last few years. People like the rustic look of them. The um, they retail anywhere from forty to eighty dollars, and um, it seems like every spring, a bunch of different places around the county have them on sale, where you can find them for forty dollars. Uh, everything from the big box stores to uh, the local hardware store to even my local grocery store will have some out front in the spring, um, and so. It's, it's, a, it's a nice inexpensive way to go, $40 for a container that's 26 inches across. You could put, put a full-size tomato in there. You can put uh, other larger plants or a small tree in there. It works out really well. Similar to the, to the uh, galvanized containers, these usually don't have holes drilled in the bottom of, bottom of them, and you want to make sure that you do that. 
So what I do is I'll do five one inch holes on the bottom and kind of, a, you know, like the way a five holes would be on a, on a, on a dice and um, to give it proper drainage. So as I said, a lot of people like the rustic look of these. I've got a half a dozen of them along a the fence on the side of my house that I plant a variety of things in there. Um, they are porous like, um, like the terracotta pots are. So, I mean, that's one of the advantages of them for wine is it allows the wine to breathe a little bit. And so that wood will breathe as well. Um, so what that means is you have to uh, make sure you're watering thoroughly, particularly all the way around the edges to make sure that the soil is consistently moist all the way across. Um, different than some of the other containers, these aren't really movable. Um, they're large and they're, and they're very heavy. And so it tends to be wherever you decide to put these, that's where they're going to be. Um, and what happens over the course of several years, even if you do, I, I put two by fours under these to get them off the ground. But even over, over several years, the bottoms will eventually rot out a bit. And so they're not really movable. And then the other possibilities are really kind of endless. So um, there's all kinds of different containers out there. You can repurpose, like for instance, on the right side there is a 15 gallon uh, tree, plastic tree pot that is great for growing tomatoes in. If you're adventurous, the container on the, on the bottom left there is actually one that I made out of cement. I cast it out of cement. I did it as Christmas present several years ago, um, which was kind of fun. Maybe not for everybody. But uh, you also see these, these uh, wooden containers that are on legs. So you're not bending over to, to plant them. Um, they don't take up a lot of space. This is one that my neighbor has that, that he grows in year round. Right now he's got some great onions growing in there. And then also popular are the um, are the are the the bags, the fabric bags used. Uh, a lot of people use them for potatoes or for tomatoes, so that they can they they're very large. They run anywhere from fifteen to forty dollars. Um, and then when you're done with them, you just dump them out, and you can rinse them out, and then fold them up and so and put them away for the winter. But the, the grow bags work actually, it work out very well for, for seasonal produce or for seasonal flowers. So the, the master gardeners talk about the four foundations of success, and that's going to be soil, water, aeration, and sun. And we're, we're going to talk about it in terms of containers and really kind of point out where it's different in each case from planting in the ground. And the first step is soil. So let's define what soil is. In-ground soil is made up of really four principal components. It is about 45% minerals, which is silt, sand, and clay, and or clay. It, it is, uh, there, there's usually about 5% organic matter in there. And organic matter is the decomposing material that may be plant or animal. Um, that breaks down in the soil. And then the other half is air and water, split between air and water. And um, now how that compares to potting soil, it's very different. And for instance, if we look at the ingredients, these are two, two brands that are very popular in nurseries. They're, it's their top quality potting soil that you'll find in local nurseries here. And if you read through the ingredients, a lot of it is forest material. It is, it is wood material. So for instance, fir bark, aged redwood, peat moss, um, and then there's some amendments in there, um, all kinds of different things from feather meal to gypsum to bat guano to earthworm castings, all kinds of different things. But it's predominantly wood products. And that's really intentional because when you're planting in an artificial environment like a container, 
the moisture can only go up or down. It can only evaporate or it can go through the holes in the bottom of the pot. It can't diffuse out the sides. It does a little bit in terracotta or in a wood barrel, but it's not like it, it would diffuse through the ground. And so you can't use a heavy soil, a ground soil in a container because it will, it'll, it'll hold too much water, saturate the roots and really over time cause them to rot. And so where, where in regular soil, it's gonna be, ground soil is gonna be about 45% minerals. If you look at the two handfuls here of each of these, the mineral portion is really just the white specks you see in there. So the little bit of pumice or perlite or sand, and then the rest of it is, is gonna be organic matter and, and the amendments. So uh, very different than what you would use in the ground. And, and it's required to be that way. When it comes to watering a, a container, it's very different than in a ground. When you're watering a container, you wanna make sure that you get the whole pot, all of the soil in the pot nice and moist. Um, I like to use a moisture meter. When I water, before I water, I stick it in and it's either going to be dry, moist, or wet. I like to keep all my flowers in the middle there moist. Um, and I move it around in different places because it might be wet on this side and dry over here. So if needed, I water. You could also use your finger. I just find it easier to use the just instant read. This is pretty reliable. I like to use those. Uh, some people like to water their containers uh, drip system. And if it works for you, that's great. I like to water all of my pots by hand so I can see what's happening. Um, and I also make sure when I'm watering by hand, I have it on shower, that spray shower on my nozzle. And I can really get that whole container nice and moist. When I see the water start to percolate, kind of boot, boot, boot. I know that there's still some air pockets in there and maybe some dry soil. So I water till I don't see that anymore. And I like to see the water come out the bottom. So I know that I've got all of this soil nice and moist. Um, take advantage of having a big pot. Uh, the pot that I'm gonna plant today is 15 inches in diameter and about 14 inches tall filled with soil. This won't dry out, dry out as fast as a, a, a smaller pot would. So I don't have to water as often once everything gets, you know, rooted and established. Um, the drip system, you know, when you water by drip, it, can, it grows down kind of in a triangle. So it's easy to miss that those roots when they're first planted, you know, the small, when you, a small container like this, those roots are right here. So you wanna make sure if you're gonna use a drip system, I would water by hand till things get established and then let it go to drip. And also I would never put the drip, I see some people sometimes put their drip line up the hole at the bottom and then that usually gets clogged. So if you're gonna use the drip, I would take it on the outside and then pin it in and maybe have a bubbler and really get that soil nice and moist. You don't want it to, to dry out. And to help keep that moisture in, especially during a drought, you want to mulch. Mulch is great, we know, on the ground, but a lot of people forget about mulching their containers. I like to use small bark mulch. Uh, some places they call it micro mulch or micro bark or fine bark. I like to use small chips and put it around top of my soil with that maybe an inch thick, and that does definitely holds in the moisture. Uh, so Next fertilizing slide. for for containers also matters as well. Um, the It's important that you fertilize regularly in order to get your best results. I know some people will We'll try to get away with it if you're planting in the ground. I'll fertilize maybe once or twice or not keep a great eye on it. But the, the nutrients in soil, in, in potting soil, gets depleted much faster than planting in the ground. And so if what you're looking to grow is, is great tomatoes or if you're looking to produce beautiful flowers, you really need to fertilize based on the, the package instructions to 
to produce those results. And, um, and it is very important that you follow the label instructions. I, I, I had a case a couple weeks ago where we had, a, um, we had our great tomato plant sale and a customer bought, you know, eight tomato plants and he came back a week later and he says, oh no, they're, they're all dead. And so we tried to figure out what happened and what, it, what we kind of figured out is that he put in way too much fertilizer in the soil. So where the space that he had called for um, about a pound and a half or two pounds of your typical organic fertilizer in a four pound bag, a pound and a half, two pounds of that, he put in two full bags. And so, you know, he just basically uh, burned up those tender little plants um, in a week. So you really want to follow the label instructions. So like here's an example of what can happen over fertilizing citrus. So um, you really want to want to follow what's on the bag there. And so Let's talk briefly about, you could do a whole separate session on fertilizers, but um, let's just kind of cover the basics of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And one way to think of those, the, the way Shauna explains it is, think of, think of it as, as growing up, growing down, and growing around. So for instance, the nitrogen is going to stimulate plant growth, phosphorus is going to stimulate root growth, potassium is going to stimulate going around the plant, whether that's fruit or flowers, or um, it, it's, it's, it's for the fruiting process. And so if you look at the numbers, these are all percentages of what's in the bag. If you look at the numbers of what's in there, it makes sense to you. So with a starter fertilizer, I'm less concerned about, about stimulating a lot of growth with the plant. I'm trying to roots when I first plant it, and then a low number for the potassium because I'm not really concerned about fruiting at that point. And then if I'm just looking for general fertilizing, I'll do a balance of all three. And then if I'm really trying to stimulate flower growth, um, we'll concentrate on phosphorus and, and potassium. And so with a high number on those to produce greater blooms. sunlight requirements for containers. So you wanna figure out where you're gonna put your, your pots. If you're gonna have them in all day shade, then of course you're gonna look for some shade plants. If you have all day sun, full sun plants. And every nursery is going to, or big box store, all the plants should be listed for sun or for shade. Sometimes they say part shade. Well, if the shade is in the morning and you have shade in the morning and sun in the afternoon, I would recommend a sun plant because it's going to be in the hottest part of the day from one o'clock on you have sun, look for sun plants. And vice versa, if you have sun in the morning and then one o'clock on you have shade, I would go with shade plants. Now, gardening we know is local. So if you live out in uh, Brentwood, and you have, you have full sun in Brentwood, or you live in Oakland and you have full sun in Oakland, well, you could probably get away with some plants that can take more shade in full sun in Oakland, but that would not work in Brentwood. A lot of times you see in magazines, they have beautiful pictures of containers all mixed together and they've got sun and shade plants. And then you think, oh, we can do the same thing. And you go in the nursery and you start buying all these plants and put it together. Uh, someone won't be happy. Either the sun ones are going to fry or the shade ones are going to um, just not be happy. They're going to fry. The sun ones are going to stretch for the sun if it's in too much shade. So think about that when you're planting. And um, containers are affected by hot and cold. If you live in a very cold area, um, that terracotta container could freeze in the wintertime and crack. So maybe you wanna put some, a bubble wrap or something around it to keep that from freezing. And again, with the galvanized containers, those get very hot in the sun, in the full sun. So I would put them maybe where they get a little more shade. 
in the afternoon, or just know that you might have to water more or line them maybe with um, some fabric so they won't heat up as much. Um, the ability to move containers to optimize sun, putting your containers on a roller and you've got a sunny side over here, you can roll it. It's sunny during um, the winter time. You can plant sun loving plants there, winter bloomers, annuals, and then maybe it's shady in the summertime. You can move it, move it again to where you get more sun. Um, the key is to just know what plants you're putting in your pot and then have it accordingly. Sun plants in the sun, shade plants in the shade. This is a picture here of just different plants planted. These were planted for full sun. Um, I like to do what I call thrillers, fillers, and spillers, where the tall plant that gives you the height, that's your thriller, and then fillers filling it out, and then the spiller spilling over. In this container, I used a um, kangaroo paw for the thriller and the mesias, which are my favorite fillers. And I have the million bells as a spiller. I have two spillers in this pot, the million bells and also a thyme, which is evergreen. That one is called transparent yellow and it's very pretty, a chartreuse green. And it looks great, I think, with that orange pot. All righty, I am going to show you how I like to put together a container. I have a bicolor or a uh, two-tone pot here. All right, can you see it? Yep. All right. So like I said earlier, this container is 15 inches in diameter in the width and about 15 inches tall maybe 14 inches. It has a one inch hole at the bottom. I like to use a uh, drywall tape, drywall tape over the hole, or you could use window screen. And that's all I put at the bottom. I don't use rocks or um, some people use um, terracotta shards, clay shards. I find that that doesn't, it doesn't drain as you would think that it would drain well, but it doesn't. It just puddles right there. So I, the only thing I use is window screen or the drywall tape and the rest is soil. I have good potting soil. I'm gonna cover that. I like to just scoop a scoop in there so I can make sure that that screen doesn't move around on me. So that's there. Oh, okay. All right, filling this all up with good potting soil. I'm almost going to the top, maybe about an inch from the rim because I need that for my water well. I don't want to have soil all the way to the top, leaving a little room. All right, all soil, filled up with soil. And then I'm going to use a little starter fertilizer. And for this, I'm following the instructions. On the container, it says to use about seven tablespoons for a container this size. All right, now that's the starter fertilizer, an organic starter, starter. It's just going to get the roots moving, and that's what I want. So that middle number is higher than the other numbers, just to get the roots moving. Okay, for the height in this pot, uh, this is going to be a full sun container. I'm going to put in an Agastache, Agastache Sunrise Salmon Pink. That's going to be my thriller. Agastache or Agastache, A-G-A-S-T-A-C-H-E, Sunrise Salmon Pink. I like to loosen the roots a little bit. 
not too much. I don't want to fool with them too much. If it were really root bound, I would have to do that, but this looks good. Just so the roots won't continue to grow in a circle. Now, I don't like to put my thriller dead center. So I'm going to put this a little to the left. And when I'm finished planting, I will show you the end result. Fillers. So I have one thriller in there. That's all I need. That's going to get about, I believe this plant gets about two feet tall. And that's perfect for a pot this size. I never want my thriller to get more than one and a half times the height of my container. All right, next I'm gonna put in a coleus. Now I mentioned not mixing sun and shade plants together, but these newer varieties of coleus can take full sun. Now it's not a great idea to plant a coleus, uh, put up a pot together and put in a coleus in full sun here in Pittsburgh in the middle of July or August, but putting it in now, it'll have plenty enough time to acclimate and it will be just fine. And I know this because I put, I have coleus growing right now that look fabulous in full sun. I'm gonna put this right next to my salvia. I like this dark foliage, of course, with the, I'm kind of going with a purpley burgundy theme here, the pink from the Agastache. Hummingbirds love this plant. It's like a salvia in the same family. Hummingbirds love it. It will bloom from spring into fall with deadheading, and we'll talk about that in a minute. I'm also going to put in an anemisia. Love that. I tell you, anemisias are my favorite fillers. This one is called Honey Orange Flame Bicolor. Is that gorgeous? I love it. Love it, love it. All right, I'm going to put this making way. I wanna make sure all the plants are at the same level. Oh, I don't want one too low, another too high. So I put my hands in like so and make sure they're all at the same level, which is about an inch from the rim. Okay, we have one thriller and two fillers. I'm gonna put my spiller in, but I think I have room. I have room. This is a good size pot. I'm gonna put one more filler right there. Let's see. Ooh. Yeah. This is an osteospermum. Ooh, osteospermum, and this one is called Premier Purple Sun. It's a, almost three colors in that, orange, yellow, and that hot pink purple. This will get about 16 inches by 16 if you let it. But I like to deadhead and I like to shear my plants and keep them in check. All right, that looks nice. Now I have room for one spiller. And I am going to put in, oh yeah, Million Bells, the number one spiller for full sun. This one's called Super Bells Holy Smokes. And that's a purple, white, and a yellow throat. This will bloom nonstop from spring until fall. Doesn't need deadheading. Million Bells usually self-deadhead. I like to have my spiller kind of off to the side, kind of kitty corner from the thriller. Need a little more soil. And kind of push them gently down. Make sure again that they're all at the same level and backfill where needed. I also like to tamp it, tamp it down and then backfill more soil. All righty, so that is like so. 
So I have my thriller here. That's the Agus Dash. And again, this can get about two feet tall. This filler and amnesia will fill out this side. The osteo will fill here. My coleus will fill out this side. And then the spiller will cascade. Now I like the spiller to just soften the edge of the pot. I don't want it to take over the whole pot. So I'm in control. I, I treat pots um, like a bonsai. So you have to do some deadheading. You have to do a little maintenance to keep them going. They're not going to continue to bloom if you don't deadhead. One of my favorite um, things to do is go through and deadhead, remove the spent flowers so they'll keep on blooming. This coleus, I don't like the flower of a coleus. I like coleus just for its foliage. So I pinch it to make sure that it doesn't uh, flower on me. And I want it to get full and bushy. Uh, this container will last definitely through the fall. The salvia will die back in the winter. The nemesia will be evergreen in mild areas. The million bells are, are evergreen in mild areas. The osteo will stop blooming, but it should still be alive. And the coleus will die. The coleus is an annual. So you'll pull that out before the frost and then uh, put in maybe violas in the, in the winter time. With my pots, I do like to, I do like to put them on risers. So I mentioned that earlier, I don't want the pot sitting directly on the ground, so I use risers. And there's many kind that you can get out there on the market. All right, I'm gonna show some of my favorite plants. This is a container that is finished. Um, that one is for shade. The Thriller and that is a garden meister, a fuchsia garden meister. The fillers are King Kong Coleus, Carex Ice Stance in the back there. You can barely see the Carex. Uh, Pentas, which is an annual, that's the red flower in the front. And the Lismachia is a great spiller. It can be a thug sometimes, so you gotta be in control and just cut it back and keep it spilling and not taking over the pot. For full sun, which is at least six hours, six to eight hours, some of the favorite spiller uh, thrillers that I like to use are salvias for sure. There are many salvias, many, many, many salvias on the market. This one is called Autumn Sage Mirage Hot Pink. Of course, hummingbirds love salvias. This one will get 18 inches tall and 18 inches wide. Very popular. Nemesias as a filler. They come in so many different colors. You've got to stay on the deadheading, but these will bloom. They even bloom in the winter time. If you keep feeding and deadheading, nemesias are some of my favorite, favorite plants. Uh, Euphorbias, this one is called Ascot Rainbow, and you can keep it in check. It's not one that will reseed and take over your whole garden. I like that it has uh, the dark bronzy, chartreuse green and a light green. This one may be 18, 20 inches by 20. You'll need a big pot for this one. This could be a thriller or a filler. You can, again, shear it to keep it the, the size you want. Some spillers, Bidens are my, another great spiller. Bees love this. I have, uh, this one is called Taka Taka Tuka Red Glow. I have one that is orange and it's been blooming since last October. And I've deadheaded, but not as much as I, I should, but it's still blooming like crazy. Great spiller, that's Biden's, B-I-D-E-N-S, look for that. And for shade, a few shade plants that I have to show you today. What morning sun yeah. and afternoon shade, a stilby. A stilby is a great plant. This is a true herbaceous perennial. It will die down in the winter, come back every year. Nice uh, ferny foliage when it's not in bloom. The flowers are usually white, red, or burgundy and pink. And a stilby, great thriller for the shade. 
when it comes to shade plants, we all know that there's not a whole lot of flowers in the shade. So when you're working in the shade, you want to use some coleus, pretty foliage. There's many out there. This one is dragon heart um, for a spiller. I love the um, this silver falls. That silver falls dichondra, a pretty gray silver. This looks fabulous in a black pot or dark pot, any color pot, but against the black, very pretty. Bacopa, Bacopa is the number one spiller for shade. If you have sun, it's the million bells. If you have shade, Bacopa, this comes in white, pink, and purple, and that will bloom almost all year. And again, don't be afraid to give them a haircut because you don't want that spiller covering your pretty pot. So just cascading and just softening the edge. That's what I like a spiller to do. Well, this one is for the sun. I forgot to show you. This is an oregano, uh, Kent Beauty oregano, beautiful uh, Brax. They're, they're white, chartreuse green and pink uh, spill over very nicely. An ornamental oregano. It's too woody to use for um, uh, culinary. So just put it in a garden, ornamental oregano called Kent Beauty. One of my absolute favorites for full sun. And then the Lismachia aria is a nice spiller for the shade. Again, this can be a thug, so don't be afraid to just, you know, when it gets out of control, just snip, snip. Just you be in control, use your pruners and keep it the way you want it. All right. And you'll get this list. If you fill out our, our um, survey, you will have a list of my favorite thrillers, fillers, and spillers. Don't forget to keep all your pots nice and moist. I'm going to, after this class, I'm gonna water this very good till water comes out the bottom. Then I'm gonna water it again. I'm gonna make use of this big pot and get all of this soil nice and moist. And eventually those roots will grow down into this soil. Um, it depends on the weather. It might need uh, watering every day for a couple of days or every other day. I'm always going to check first. I'm not just going to go out and water. I'm going to really see if it needs it before I water. Um, the, the older it gets, the less often I'll have to water because this pot is so big, it can really retain the moisture. I'm going to fertilize according to uh, the instructions. I like to use a bloom food that is uh, high uh, 32020. It's made with um, seaweed. I like to use that weekly. You can use it, the instructions say every seven to 14 days. Remember, the only food that this pot is going to get is what you give it. It's not like there's worms in here and mycorrhizae and all kind of. Um, you know, things like that to add nutrients to the soil. And every time I water, the nutrients that's in there is gonna, they're gonna come leaching out. So I gotta keep putting in the nutrients. So I'm gonna do that with the fertilizing. I'm going to deadhead regularly. Uh, these osteospermums, if you stop deadheading them, they will stop blooming. And that's pretty much with, with your roses and all your flowers their whole main goal in life is to go to seed and you want to fool them from going to seed so they'll just keep on blooming for you. And if you do that, if you deadhead, they will keep on going. So get you some snips and dead. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about fruits and veggies. And so uh, I want to start with with this picture here. This is my daughter's patio in Southern California, and she loves to she loves to cook. She doesn't have a lot of room. It's just an apartment patio, um, but she wants to grow fresh herbs. And I think this is a great way to start. I, I, I don't like to see people jump in and, and put in a whole bunch of containers or plant a whole big area if they're not going to be able to take care of it. You want to you want to be able to plant what you can use and plant what you love. And so in, in these couple of pots, she's got fresh oregano, fresh mint, fresh thyme, sage, some parsley, some chives, and which is great. Great for, great for what she likes to cook. And it's small and it's manageable and it's, um, it's a good way to get started. 
And some of those things like oregano or mint are better in a pot than they are in the ground because you know those, those two wanna take over the world. So um, bet much better in a pot. And so I, I saw a question go by about, um, do you really need a pot that big for the flowers? And there's a couple of things to that. It, part of it is the roots that these plants require. And it doesn't matter if it's flowers or if it's vegetables. Um, certain plants are, are gonna require much deeper containers if you're gonna plant in containers. And so you can grow just about anything in a container, but you're gonna need a container that's gonna be able to accommodate it. So for instance, if it's only fairly shallow rooted, less than 18 inches, that, that box that was on legs that we saw at the beginning there um, is great for planting some of these smaller things like onions and lettuce and spinach, that these things that don't have deep root structures. Um, and you can also probably get away with putting some uh, bush beans in there and maybe some snap peas, that kind of thing. But if you're going to plant things that have deep roots, um, like tomatoes, you're going to need a fairly large container to be able to do that. Um, and another advantage of a larger container is you may not have to water as frequently because if if something's in a small container, it's gonna dry out much faster and you're out there watering it every day. If it's in a larger container, those roots can be soaked deeply and it'll last a couple of days instead of every day. Um, and so something to distinguish here on tomatoes, um, you'll see, you've probably heard of indeterminate tomatoes and determinate tomatoes. Determinate tomatoes are ones that are a fixed size. Some people call, will call them container tomatoes because they really don't get that big. You know, they end up being a, a shrub, maybe the size, well, a little bigger than a basketball. Um, where indeterminate tomatoes are the ones that grow into big tall vines as far as you'll let them go. Most people let them go six, six seven feet tall. Um, something like that is gonna have a very deep root structure and really about the only place you can plant that is probably a wine barrel or something that size. You can't put that even in a pot the size that Shauna's got there for the flower demo. Um, that could take a, a, a determinate tomato, but it couldn't take an indeterminate tomato. It needs a lot more space. So, so what can be grown in a container? Really anything, depending on the size of the container. Just depends on the size of the container. And so there's a couple ways you can go. You can do single plants or you can do multiples in one container. So. Personally, I like to grow strawberries in, in pots rather than in the ground. I, I just seem to have more luck with it. And I don't know if it's because I pay more attention to the water or I manage the pests better or the fertilizer better, but it just seems to work better for me um, doing strawberries in containers. Um, and as my sister knows, while I was out of town last week, she had to water all those containers. So... Um, <laughs> But the, uh, the other thing that people like to grow in uh, containers is small trees, uh, small fruit trees, particularly citrus. Citrus does great in, uh, in, a, in a large pot. So this is, this is a lemon tree that's probably eight years old and um, it's been moved up a couple of times on, the di on different container sizes, but um, it does really well. It gives me probably 15 or 20 lemons a year. Um, it's in bloom right now, so it smells great. It looks great. It's really a nice addition to a patio, just having a few, a few lemons available all the time. The other thing it enables you to do in doing it in container is is plant some things that are different that you wouldn't plant otherwise. So on the left is my fig tree. And I don't want a ton of figs. I don't want a giant fig tree, but I, I like having 15 or 20 figs every late summer, early fall, um, and that's enough. And so I've got this great little tree that provides that. You can also plant some things that are a little different that you that you wouldn't normally, you don't wanna give space to in your yard. This, this container on the right is a gooseberry. Um, which uh, 
goes back hundreds of years in this country that gooseberries have been hugely popular. They're a, they're a tart little berry that people make pies out of and make jam out of. Um, and so I've got one of those in a pot just because again, I don't want a ton of gooseberries, but I like having some gooseberries. And so the care that's necessary in doing small trees in pots is you need to pot them up every couple of years. Uh, as we said at the beginning, this, the soil can get depleted over time. Um, really every two years is kind of the outside for, for adding additional soil and kind of rejuvenating what's in the pot and moving it up to the next size. So the reason you do that is you don't want it to be become completely root bound in, uh, in that container and you want to refresh the soil. So this little lemon tree on the, on the right there is a lemon tree I grew from seed that I picked up in Italy. Um, I don't recommend doing that, <laughs> it doesn't, it's not great. But, but the tree in the middle is that, is that eight year old tree. And then this is a blood orange tree that's probably, oh, uh, it's probably over 10 years old now. Um, and so I get, this, I get this handful of different different fruit available on each of them, but you want to move them up um, as, they, as they grow and as the roots expand. And then when you're watering these, you want to make sure you're watering the whole soil there, um, right edge to edge, particularly if you're in terracotta to make sure all those roots get moistened. And then you want to fertilize as directed. With, with citrus, uh, the, the fertilizer that I use recommends fertilizing once a month and uh, through the spring and summer. And if you really want to get fruit, if you want to produce the yield that you want, um, you, you really need to do that. And then I'll also top dress with compost a couple times a year, um, just to add some additional nutrition there. And then as Shauna said on, on, the, on the flower planters, I mulch over the top and I'll do, I'll do crumbled leaves or I'll do compost and to mulch over the top of these. There's actually a, a, a citrus for containers, a whole, a whole class on that whole um, uh, video on that. It's gonna be posted to our, to the Master Gardeners YouTube channel here in a couple days. So there's a whole bunch more information there about doing citrus in containers. And so you can also do multiple planting and, and you can really kind of follow kind of what Shauna said about thrillers and fillers and spillers. So in this, in this uh, container here, I've got a cherry tomato in the back there that's going to grow up that trellis that's behind it. And then I've got a couple of pepper plants on the side of that. I've got a basil up front, and then I've got um, some uh, thyme here on the left side that's gonna spill over um, and kind of fill in around that. Um, and that's something you can do in a, in a container that size. And something smaller, you can certainly put in a, um, a container-sized tomato plant, a determinant tomato plant with some flowers around it, like these marigolds. I actually like to put uh, uh, nasturtium seeds, plant nasturtium seeds in a number of my containers and have that spill out as well. And then the, the planting season doesn't really end with just the summer. It doesn't have to. So for instance, this is a tomato plant that I had in a different barrel last year. At the end of the season, I chopped it up and used it as a mulch to go over the top of the soil. Now, just to point out with tomatoes, if, if that plant was diseased, diseased at all, you don't want to mulch it on top of the soil. You want to pull that plant out, roots and all, and throw it actually in your trash bin, not, not the green bin, um, if, that plant, if that tomato is diseased. And that's true of a number of the nightshades, whether it's eggplant or, or tomato or uh, peppers. If there's any, any diseases there, you want to pull that plant out when you're done and, and throw it in the trash and not leave it in the soil. But this plant was perfectly healthy, so I chopped it up and I used it to mulch over the top of the soil. And then in there, I planted a broccoli plant, um, which uh, I had broccoli from for the whole winter. And I just, I just pulled that out 
actually cut it off, leaving the roots to decompose in place. But what cut that off to uh, um, a month or so ago in order to plant in that barrel for this year. Um, another option, if, if they're gonna keep those containers year round, particularly like the wine barrels or something large like that, is to put a cover crop in and that'll continue to feed, to feed the soil through the winter. And that cover crop can be fava beans, it can be mustard greens. There's a bunch of different ones that you can use to feed the soil and keep that active and, and energized through the winter. Um, there's actually a, a library talk coming up, I, uh, I, I think in September, which is just on cover crops, which I recommend. It's a great thing to do for your soil, whether it's in ground or in a container. And then something else you could do, if I chose not to plant this, you could I could just chop up those, uh, that previous plant and then just put a layer of compost over that soil to feed it for the winter. But I know a lot of people, you know, they, they have a couple of pots that they grow tomatoes in every year and that's, and that's what they want to do. And, um, and then otherwise they put the pots away for the winter. It's a good idea, particularly with something like tomatoes, which can be you know, so disease prone, is to clean those pots afterwards with soap and water. So to rinse them out, um, wash them with soap and water, and then ideally take the additional step of sanitizing the pots with a 10% with a bleach solution. So nine parts water to one part, um, to one part bleach and, and rinse that through the pot and then, and then give it a rinse with clear water and then put it away for the winter to dry. And uh, it'll prevent you from carrying over any diseases into the next year to plant your tomatoes in it again. So kind of a quick summary of what we've covered there. Um, we, we talked about a, different, a bunch of different options for containers. We talked about using quality potting soil, um, not, not using ground soil. The difference that can be made with watering properly and fertilizing properly for best results. Uh, following Shauna's thrill, fill and spill uh, procedure for, for beautiful containers. And it can also work for planting veggies. And then to dead, deadhead to keep them blooming and then grow the vegetables or the vegetables and the edibles that you love year round. 